we've got scheduled in about 20 minutes of discussion. Uh, any talks that have been given today or even tomorrow since we got cut a little bit yesterday. So now is the time. Any questions about modeling? Joe? Do the aerosols play any role in influencing what's going to happen to the ash? Because the aerosols will presumably influence the, the amount of energy that's in the, the atmosphere. Sorry, Jill, let's try that. Do the, aeros Do the aerosols have any role in influencing how the ash behaves? Oh. This one's not hooked up to the speaker system, is it? It is. It is, okay. We also okay. have this one. Um, uh, yeah, they do actually. Um, so, but it's kind of funny. Um, so the ash particles can just fall out of the atmosphere without respect to what the SO2 or anything else is doing that was generated by the, by the eruption. But what happens typically, or a lot of times, is the ash can act as nuclei for the aerosol to, to, to stick to. And then it can eventually, it can ripen on the, the ash particles and then go through uh, various chemical reactions. And then it can be flushed out with the ash particles. A lot of times the aerosol cloud and the ash cloud can remain totally separated and they don't really interact very much. So the, 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 the interaction between the two can be very weak up to quite strong actually. Can you say something about uh, the difference uh, in, in settling of particles within the troposphere and, and above it? And also this, this uh, phenomenon that I've heard from various uh, uh, atmospheric modelers that uh, in addition to the, this very large umbrella cloud which can go against against prevailing winds, you also have the phenomenon of counter winds at higher altitudes at a, a, a much more complicated circulation. Yeah, yeah, those, those are really important things. The stratosphere is called stratosphere because it's stratified. So, um, <laughs> uh, so the, the main result of that is actually that, so it's broken up into layers. And some of those layers uh, convect pretty strongly, uh, partly, because of, partly because of wind shear between different layers and partly because of, uh, of uh, heating. Um, so in, those, in, in, in the layers in the, in the stratosphere uh, that are turbulent, that's going to cause the particles that are falling out of the, upper, the air above that layer to come down into that layer and they're going to get carried around in that turbulence and they're going to stick there for a long time and cause that layered appearance to the, the clouds. Now, that, that layering does occur in the troposphere sometimes, but it's, it's, not, it's not regional, it's local, and it, it dies out very fast. So you do get that, you can get that kind of thing happening in the troposphere too, but it's not very persistent at all. So once the, the particles uh, settle out of these uh, stratified layers in the, in the stratosphere, uh, they settle through the troposphere, and it's kind of hit or miss whether they're gonna be, remain in suspension for any length of time. As they get closer to the ground surface, they get, start to get affected by the planetary ground, boundary layer. Okay? And, and because that has a lot of turbulence in it, that can keep them up there for a while too. Okay? So basically, you go from these layers in the stratosphere that really like to hold particles in them uh, with cl relatively clear air between, then they come out of the tropopause and go down through the troposphere. Maybe they'll, get mixed, maybe they'll remain suspended a little bit better, maybe not. Um, but then they'll get into the planetary boundary layer, and that'll tend to keep them in suspension a little bit more, and then they'll, then they'll finally settle out. Um, I guess one other thing about that is that what you can ultimately get then is, is what's called wall deposition, where particles are just, they're not actually settling out according to their settling speed. That almost has nothing to do with it. They're settling out because they, they're in these turbulent structures. The turbulence structure, an eddy, hits the ground, and the particle <laughs> particle gets deposited just because the, the eddy hit the ground. So sometimes the, the settling speed is a good guide to 
how fast the particles are going to settle out and what grain size you're going to see. But a lot of times, it's not a good guide at all. And that's why it's really hard for these models to predict how big the particles are going to be that are going to settle out at any one point. Uh, Marcus, just a very quick follow-on to that. Yeah, the, the grain size effect, at, at what is kind of a, a threshold range of grain size where things are going to settle fast enough where they don't get caught up in this turbulence so much? Um, so the, the turbulence uh, structure in the volcanic plume is, is super strong. So you've got to get a particle that's bigger than a baseball or a softball, or for our uh, foreign friends here, a <laughs> I don't know. A grapefruit. Yeah, but you're talking really close to the base. Yeah. these greater distances. Yeah, so the, the, the particles that are basically 100 microns is kind of around the dividing line where it's a kind of a big particle relative to the atmospheric motions. You know. Another key thing, stratosphere versus troposphere, is that the weather happens in the troposphere. So you get rain out and, and a lot more of these particle aggregation effects happening in addition to the turbulence effects. So it's really dry in the stratosphere. And, you know, in addition to the wind, you get a lot less particle nucleation and growth um, up there. Yeah. That's, a good, that's a good point. All that wet aggregation happens in the troposphere, not, not in the stratosphere. So I have kind of a big picture question for Alexa, Marcus, and uh, Leah in terms of modeling is what can this group do, people who participate in Tupra collection, um, to help you guys with your modeling efforts? Um, I know one thing that I try to do if we have precursory activity to an eruption is to contact people that I know from the IOPSE uh, ASH modeling group and ask them about, well, what, where should I sample? You know, what's the sample grid? What's the best case scenario? And then I have to include all of my limitations, like I have to use a helicopter, so I can't go everywhere, that kind of thing. Um, and how, how do I do this so that you guys can best model? But what, what sorts of things can we do to help you guys improve the models um, so that they're you know, good validation data sets or something like that? I, I got an immediate answer to that, and then if you guys want to answer too. But one of the, that's kind of one of the uh, one of the things I was excited about, uh, get, about getting together with this group of people was just um, giving us a chance to talk about uh, long-range transport and talk about uh, what the distal deposit looks like in terms of grain size and thickness and things like that. And uh, it's sort of a dream in the back of my mind is that someday somebody will make a really cool isopath map or a, a grain size isopleth map that covers couple of thousand kilometers away from the vent and we could actually see what a what the ash deposition looked like uh, over a huge region so so that's collecting data on what the ash deposit looks like at great distances I think is really is really interesting in sort of a volcanological format you know <laughs> so another thing, and just thinking about some of the questions from earlier, is, is just to get the questions that people have. You know, what are the outstanding questions of specific deposits or their specific grain size characteristics? You know, if there, if there are um, case studies that need to be looked at or, or kind of examined, that really helps push the science forward from the atmospheric modeling perspective. Um, so that's, that's really important if there are certain cases. And the other thing I think that's a huge gap in the community is communicating between atmospheric modelers and the geologists. So what, what does the geology tell us about the likelihood of you know, a, a certain magnitude eruption and the frequency of those eruptions? Because from a forecasting perspective, if that's known, then there can be a sort of forecast model uh, created so, you know, going back to that top of volcanic zone example, if there's new work that shows that a, a certain magnitude eruption is more likely than another, that can really be used to feed into a sort of hazard mapping context. So communicating between the two are, is a huge gap. What is the attitude to communicate? What uh, Here. <laughs> I'm just trying to get people together was in the back of my mind. But, yeah. And I, I think, like Alexa was saying, models are a tool. So when the questions change, you can change your tool to better 
address them. Um, also, another thing is, um, I, think, I think we've all said it, but um, the grain size distributions are very important. And for people that are making isopoc maps, that's not good enough for a model. You need the actual data that you used to make the map. And in fact, um, using the model, at least some of the models, like Tefer 2, because it has the inversion, you can actually use it to create an isopoc map that in some ways is better than just um, interpreting between your data points, because it will find the isopocs that are the best fit to the data. So it's really important to have the actual data and not just your interpretation of the data. In terms of communication, I think that, I mean, these workshops are fantastic, but we all have journal alert feeds now that are based on, you know, you put in your keywords that you want for your alert and you'll get all articles published that week on it. So just having consistent use of keywords so that we can bridge that gap and communicate better would be an easier or an easy way to do it. I mean, I don't have time to look through all the different journals in the world, but I have time to set up an alert that whenever it says Tefra, I'll get that, and I might get some weird medical studies, but you know, at least that's one way to help communicate is consistent use of keywords. I was just wondering about compaction. I think somebody might have asked that earlier, but how that, if you were going to communicate, if you're going to communicate more to improve your models, I don't think they take that into account, do they? No, the, the compaction is a different process. So all of these models are dealing with the atmospheric processes, and then the compaction would be, you could put it in there. It'd be a little bit different, you know, to do that, but yeah, you could. Well, mm -hmm. well, yeah. Right, yeah. So no, that's what, a real important point. Yeah. What the models tend to calculate is the mass loading of Tephra on the ground, and so then you need a conversion to get the thickness. Um, what they actually calculate is the mass. Yeah, so like kilograms per square meter kind of thing. How much amount of flexibility do we have uh, regarding the input parameters? I mean, if we are talking about the large plume in the atmosphere, you need that much amount of material, and you need to know what kind of magma mm -hmm. gases are involved in it. So should we, I mean, with the help of like amount of gases, exolution, fragmentation, can we put all this data to well, refine our, I mean, the kind of the, eruption? At the present time, there are some models um, that take into account that kind of thing, different species that come out of the volcano. The numerical weather prediction models don't have anything of that. That's not in there at all. Okay, the numerical weather prediction models have wind speeds, temperatures, pressure levels, uh, that's it, basically, okay? So there might be gas in there, uh, in the eruption, things like that, that's not gonna be taken care of in the numerical weather prediction model. But there are some of those models of the volcanic phenomena that have the different species in them and, and can, can be used. Alexa's done some work on this with what's called the Atham model mm -hmm. uh, and different, uh, what happens with the different species in the plume there. Uh, to first order approximation, uh, in most, in a lot of cases, uh, it's just a physics problem of particles settling and whether the atmosphere is keeping the particles suspended or not. Okay. So the, all the other stuff doesn't matter to first order. Okay. A lot of times. And just in terms of that, you know, basically you can expand and contract the complexity of your modeling to whatever you're interested in. So if you have interesting information on like the sulfur content of your eruption, there are models that can take that into account and look at specific problems. So it's really what you want to know, what you're the most interested in, and how much data you have available. If you have no data, all you know is that an eruption happened and you want to look at something, you know, the dispersal or climate impact of that eruption, you can, you can do that. If you have really great detailed information, you can, you can also use that depending on your tool. Yeah, it just depends on the scale of your, of your question. Uh, along the same lines, the, the models weren't des all designed to look at the same problem, um, which is why if you have a different problem, you can, you can change them for that purpose. But I think one of the biggest differences is that some models are far more simplistic and they're not necessarily meant to be used in real time 
situations, but they're really good beforehand when you want to get an idea and you don't know what the eruption's gonna be. So different models have different target questions, and the latest target question that modelers have been attempting to direct to address is the aggregation process, which none of them do a good job of as of yet. But that's like our newest question. Um, but it's not the only question. Might be helpful just to let people know, actually, a number of these you can just um, run online. So Ash 3D has an online interface, as Alexa uh, showed us. Um, uh, high, high split uh, the, from uh, the uh, NOAA, this has long had an online interface that you can run, run this model a million times with all kinds of wind fields and things like that. It's a very good, good website. And Puff has uh, for quite a long time also had an online website where you could run it. Uh, the others that don't ha can't be run through the web, a lot of them you can download and run it on your computer and, and just so long as you can fix it up and everything, you can get it to run on your computer. So these are very widely available models. Yeah. Um, this is Susan, the paleoclimatologist. This is starting to sound a lot like a discussion between data and model people in climate science. And I'm wondering if there's any um, large scale effort to link models that do atmospheric transport with models that do um, modeling of the plume and the plume processes with models that think about magma and water content and things like that, where you could go from plumbing to tephra dispersal. Yeah, that's, I mean, we're very, at the very beginnings of touching on that. Um, so, uh, so we've done a little bit of that. But that's a very, very big numerical problem uh, with a huge number of time scales and uh, spatial scales that are really hard to deal with. It's so a it's huge a, community effort. Yeah, for but sure. um, I, we've done a little bit of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it was a bit different. For all these models, we run, we use wind field in a global scale. I mean, or is that, I guess, use were like just for the uh, North America, so it's limited in other regions, or how does it work? No, all, yeah. Uh, uh, again, uh, um, this is the UK Met Office model. This is the French Meteorological Service, whatever model. Canada, uh, Italy, uh, Norway. Uh, oh, here's this is Japan. So any of the well-developed -devel countries has a has a model of their own. It's they're all made. Uh, you can run them for the scale of your region of interest because they make it for that scale of interest. Virtually all those, as you can see, they all have a G in that coverage line. So they can all transport the ash to a global scale. Most of them even use a database of all the volcanoes on Earth. And you can just put in the volcano and it'll transport ash from that volcano anywhere on Earth. They all act in very similar ways at some level. The inputs to the different models are actually quite different a, a lot of the time. So it's, it's uh, well, of course, the one, yeah, there's not, <laughs> it's easy to, it's relatively easy to, straightforward to compare them, but it's a little bit hard to get them to run in parallel. We've tried a lot of that, actually. It's, it's quite difficult, yeah. Thank you. Uh, let me share with you guys uh, the experience we are having with Tefra 2 in Colombia, because we are uh, using this like a tool for updating the hazard maps for Purase and uh, Nevado del Ruiz volcanoes. We are having so much trouble with the parameters and thank to the BHAB guys we are um, figuring out uh, many, many things, and the results are very good, are very uh, reliable, and, but uh, like Leah said before, that is not a um, hazard map, per se. It's just a tool for us to, to um, delimitate areas for uh, hazards and uh, things like that. And uh, I think 
Uh, this is a great space to share this with you because this is um, the real world uh, for these models. Uh, that is, they are not perfect, but uh, they are very good and it's very helpful to have some um, things to work with. Yeah, so that's, a, that's an excellent point. I think, again, one of the things that we can do collectively, those of us who collect ashfall, is exactly what uh, Alexa brought up, which is to communicate the geologic information that we're collecting so that we can develop input parameters that are realistic. Uh, that is a big problem. Uh, one advantage that the ASH 3D has on the online version is you can go in and it actually knows for each volcano the basic parameters to put in. So it just automatically puts in a realistic parameter based on the type of volcano that it is. Um, so that actually cuts out for the public a lot of errors and guessing and how do I do this? And so you're not just going on there and, and you know trying to just figure it out on your own. But it would be nice to have a set of realistic parameters for other places in the world because if we're going to try to do this on our own it's, it is complicated and it's wrong. I mean so you try to put one in there that's the most realistic for what you think is going to happen and then you want the ability to go back and update it immediately once you know a realistic plume height or for example if it's going to be a bigger eruption but at least put in something really generic. Um, so yeah, some of those exist but I think just in the U.S. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the typical one of the typical problems with numerical models is garbage in, garbage out. So, you know, we people got to keep working together and trying to work out what's the what's the way to get the right information in there to get the right information out. So. I noticed a couple of things here. Um, when you're using, for example, uh, reanalysis data using NCEPT um, and NCAR reanalysis data set, it's actually not working well for polar regions. Like ERA 40 in term, that's kind of what climate people sort of focus on. Uh, second aspect is what you have now for atmosphere is not necessarily what you had 50 years ago with a modern level of like CO2 or sulfate, for example. So you definitely have different radiative forcing there. Then if you go to like last glacial, when you have your tephra transport for like, you know, timing 40,000 years ago or something, you definitely would be dealing with different parameters for polar vortex, for circulation, for even the big atmospheric features. They might not simply work the same way. So it's something to keep in mind when you're just plugging in 100 times more size of Pinatube eruption and modern day uh, atmospheric conditions. That's about it. I think we're, that's pretty, I think we want to go to lunch now, probably. <laughs> yes.